Hi everyone, this is my ninth video. Today I'm going to read a story by Theodore Sturgeon. Now, most people know Sturgeon as the man who wrote the short story It, which inspired Alan Moore's Swamp Thing character. He also wrote the short story Killdozer, which inspired Stephen King's Maximum Overdrive. What I'm going to read today is nothing like those. This story is a science fiction writer's attempt at like a harlequin romance. It's incredibly sappy and very adorable. I like to picture the characters being played by Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward. I will have a link down below where you can find a good collection of Sturgeon's work, but be warned, it's not like this story. This is called Slow Sculpture. She didn't know who he was when she met him. Well, not many people did. He was in the high orchard doing something under a pear tree. The land smelled of late summer and wind. Bronze. It smelled bronze. He looked up at a compact girl in her mid-twenties with a fearless face and eyes the same color as her hair, which was extraordinary because her hair was red gold. She looked down at a leather-skinned man in his forties with a gold-leaf electroscope in his hand and felt she was an intruder. She said, oh, in what was apparently the right way because he nodded once and said, hold this. And there it could be then no thought of intrusion. She knelt down by him and took the instrument, holding it just where he positioned her hand. And then he moved a little away and struck a tuning fork against his kneecap. What's it doing? He had a good voice, the kind of voice strangers notice and listen to. She looked at the delicate leaves of gold in the glass shield of the electroscope. They're moving apart. He struck the tuning fork again and the leaves pressed away from one another. Much? About 45 degrees when you hit the fork. Good, he said. That's the most we'll get. From a pocket of his bush jacket, he drew a sack of chalk dust and dropped a small handful on the ground. I'll move now. You stay right there and tell me how much the leaves separate. He traveled around the pear tree in a zigzag course, striking his tuning fork while she called out numbers. 10 degrees, 30, 5 degrees, 20, nothing. Whenever the gold foil pressed apart to maximum, 40 degrees or more, he dropped more chalk. When he was finished, the tree was surrounded in a rough oval by the white dots of chalk. He took out a notebook and diagrammed them and the tree, and then put away the book and took the electroscope out of her hands. Were you looking for something? he asked her. No, she said. Yes. He could smile. Though it did not last long, she found it very surprising in a face like that. That is not, is what, that is not what's called in a court of law a responsive answer, he said. She glanced across the hillside, metallic in that late light. There wasn't much to it. Rocks, weeds the summer was done with, a tree or so, and then the orchard. Anyone present had come a long way to get here. It wasn't a simple question, she said, tried to smile, and burst into tears. She was sorry and said so. Why, he asked. This was the first time she was to experience this ask-the-next-question thing of his. It was unsettling. It always would be, never less, and sometimes a great deal more. Well, one shouldn't have emotional explosions in public. You do? I don't know about this one you're talking about. I guess I don't either, now that you mention it. So tell the truth, then. No sense going around and round thinking, oh, if I say this, he'll think that, and stuff like that. I'll think what I think, whatever you say. Or go down the mountain and just don't say anymore. She did not turn to go, so he added, try the truth then. If it's important, it's simple, and if it's simple, it's easy to say. I'm going to die, she cried. So am I, he said. I have a lump in my breast. And he said, come up to the house and I'll fix it. Without another word, he turned away and started through the orchard. 
startled half out of her wits, indignant and full of insane hope, experiencing even a quick curl of astonished laughter, she stood for a moment watching him go and then found herself running after him. She caught up with him on the uphill margin of the orchard. Are you a doctor? He appeared not to notice that she'd waited, had run. No, he said, and walking on, appeared not to see her again standing, then running and catching up. I must be out of my mind, she said, joining him on a garden path. She said it to herself, which he must have known because he did not answer. This garden was alive with defiant chrysanthemums and a pond in which she saw the flicker of a pair of red cap imperials, silver, not gold fish, which were the largest she'd ever seen. And then the house. First, it was part of the garden, with its colonnaded terrace, and then with its rock walls too big to be called fieldstone. It was on and in the hillside, and its roofs paralleled the skylines, front and sides, and part of it was backed against an outjutting cliff face. The door, beamed and studded and with two archer's slits, was opened for them, but there was no one there and when it closed it was silent, a far more solid exclusion of things outside than any click or clang of latch or bolt. She stood with her back against it, watching him cross what seemed to be the central well of the house. It was a kind of small court, in the center of which was an atrium, glazed on all five sides and open to the sky at the top. In it was a tree, a cypress or a juniper, gnarled and twisted and with the turned back, paralleled, sculptured appearance of what the Japanese call bonsai. Aren't you coming, he called, holding open a door behind the atrium. Bonsai just aren't 15 feet tall, she said. That one is. She came by it slowly, looking. How long have you had it? His tone of voice said he was immensely pleased. It is a clumsiness to ask the owner of a bonsai how old it is. You are then demanding to know if it is his work or if he has acquired and continued the concept of another. You are tempting him to claim for his own the concept and the meticulous labor of someone else. And it is rude to tell a man he is being tested. Hence, how long have you had it is polite forbearing, profoundly curious. He answered, half my life. She looked at the tree. Trees can be found sometimes, not quite discarded, not quite forgotten, potted in rusty gallon cans, not quite successful nurseries, unsold because they're shaped oddly or have dead branches here and there, or because they've grown too slowly in whole or in part. These are the ones which develop interesting trunks and a resistance to misfortune that makes them flourish if given the least excuse for living. This one was far older than half this man's life, or all of it. Looking at it, she was terrified by the unbidden thought that a fire, a family of squirrels, some subterranean worm or termite could end this beauty something working outside any concept of rightness or justice or respect. She looked at the tree. She looked at the man. Coming? Yes, she said, and went with him into his laboratory. Sit down over there and relax, he told her. This might take a little while. Over there was a big leather chair by the bookcase. The books were right across the spectrum. Reference works in medicine and engineering, nuclear physics, chemistry, biology, psychiatry, also tennis, gymnastics, chess, the Asian war game Go, and golf. And then drama, the techniques of fiction, modern English usage, the American language and its supplement, Woods and Walker's rhyming dictionaries, array of other dictionaries and encyclopedias, a whole long shelf of biographies, you have quite a library. He answered her shortly. Clearly, he did not want to talk just now, for he was very busy. He said only, yes, I have. Perhaps you'll see it sometime. 
He could only have meant, she decided, that the books beside her chair were what he kept handy for his work, but his real library was elsewhere. She looked at him with a certain awe. And she watched him. She liked the way he moved, swiftly, decisively. Clearly, he knew what he was doing. He used some equipment that she recognized, a glass still, titration equipment, a centrifuge. There were two refrigerators, one of which was not a refrigerator at all, for she could see the large indicator on the door that stood at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. It came to her that a modern refrigerator is adaptable to the demand for controlled environment even a warm one. But all that, and the equipment she did not recognize, was only furniture. It was the man who was worth watching, the man who kept her occupied so that not once in all the long time she sat there was she even tempted toward the bookshelves. At last he finished a long sequence at the bench. He threw some switches, picked up a tall stool, and came over to her. He perched on the stool, hung his heels on the cross-spoke, and laid a pair of long brown hands over his knees. Scared? I suppose I am, she said. You don't have to stay. Considering the alternative, she began bravely, but the courage sound somehow oozed out. It can't matter much. Very sound, he said, almost cheerfully. I remember when I was a kid, there was a fire scare in the apartment house where we lived. It was a wild scramble to get out, and my ten-year-old brother found himself outside in the street with an alarm clock in his hand, the old one that didn't work. But of all the things in the place he might have snatched up at a time like that, he grabbed that clock. He's never been able to figure out why. Have you figured out why? Not why he picked up that particular thing, no, but I think I know why he did something obviously irrational. You see, panic is a very special state, like fear and flight or fury and attack. It's a pretty primitive reaction to extreme danger. It's one of the expressions of the will to survive. What makes it so special is that it's irrational. Now, why would the abandonment of reason be a survival mechanism? She thought about this seriously. There was that about this man which made serious thought imperative. I can't imagine, she said finally, unless it's because in some situations reason just doesn't work. You can imagine, he said, again radiating that huge approval, making her glow. And you just did. If you're in danger and you try reason and reason doesn't work, you abandon it. You can't say it's unintelligent to abandon what doesn't work, right? So then you're in a panic, and you start to perform random acts. Most of them, far and away most, will be useless. Some might even be dangerous, but that doesn't matter. You're in danger already. Where the survival factor comes in is that a way down deep you know that one chance in a million is better than no chance at all. So here you sit. You're scared, and you could run. Something says you should run, but you won't. She nodded, and he went on. You found a lump. You went to a doctor, and he made some tests, and he gave you the bad news. Maybe you went to another doctor, and he confirmed it. You did some research and found out what was to happen next. The exploratory, the radical, the questionable recovery, the whole long agonizing procedure of being what they call a terminal case. And you flipped out did some things you hope I won't ask you about. Took a trip somewhere, anywhere. Eventually you wound up in my orchard for no reason. He spread his hands and let them go back to their kind of sleep. Panic. It's the reason for little boys in their pajamas standing at midnight with a broken alarm clock in their arms. And for the existence of quacks. Something chimed over the bench, and he gave her a quick smile and went back to work, saying over his shoulder, I'm not a quack, by the way. To qualify as a quack, you have to claim to be a doctor. I don't. She watched him switch off, switch on, stir, measure, and calculate. A little orchestra of equipment chorused and soloed around him as he conducted, whirring, hissing, clicking, flickering. 
She wanted to laugh, to cry, to scream. She did no one of these things for fear of not stopping, ever. When he came over again, the conflict was not raging within her, but exerting steady and opposed tensions. The result was a terrible stasis, and all she could do when she saw the instrument in his hand was to widen her eyes. She quite forgot to breathe. Yes, it's a needle, he said, his tone almost bantering. A long, shiny, sharp needle. Please don't tell me you're one of those needle-shy people. He flipped the long power cord, which trailed from the black housing around the hypodermic, got some slack, and straddled the stool. Do you want something to steady your nerves? She was afraid to speak. The membrane containing her sane self was very thin, stretched very tight. He said, I'd rather you didn't because this pharmaceutical stew is complex enough as it is, but if you need it. She managed to shake her head a little, and again she felt the wave of approval from him. There were a thousand questions she wanted to ask, had meant to ask, really needed to ask. What was in the needle? How many treatments must she have? What would they be like? How long must she stay? And where? And most of all, could she live? Oh, could she live? He seemed concerned with the answer to only one of these. This is mostly built around an isotope of potassium. If I told you all I know about it and how I came on it in the first place, it would take, well, more time than we've got. But here's the general idea. Theoretically, every atom is electrically balanced, never mind ordinary exceptions. Likewise, all electrical charges in the molecule are supposed to be balanced. So much plus, so much minus, adding up to zero. I happened on the fact that the balance of charges in a wild cell is not zero, not quite. It's as if there was a submicroscopic thunderstorm going on at the molecular level, with little lightning bolts flashing back and forth and changing the signs interfering with communications, like static. And that, he said, gesturing with the shielded hypo in his hand, is what this is all about. When something interferes with communications, especially the RNA mechanism, which says, read this blueprint and build accordingly and stop when it's done. When that message gets garbled, lopsided things get built, off-balance things, things which do almost what they should, do it almost right, they're the wild cells, and the message they pass on is even worse. Okay, whether these thunderstorms are caused by viruses or chemicals or radiation or physical trauma or anxiety, and don't think anxiety can't do it, that's secondary. The important thing is to fix it so the thunderstorm can't happen. If you can do that, the cells have plenty of ability all by themselves to repair and replace what's gone wrong. And biological systems aren't like ping pong balls with static charges waiting for the charge to leak away or discharge into a grounded wire. They have a kind of resilience. It enables them to take on a little more charge or a little less and do all right. Well then. Say a certain clump of cells is wild, and say it carries an aggregate of 100 units extra on the positive side. Cells immediately around it are affected, but not the next layer or the next. If they could be open to the extra charge, if they could help to drain it off, they would, well, cure the wild cells of the surplus. You see what I mean? And they would be able to handle that little overage themselves or pass it on to other cells and still others who could deal with it. In other words, if I can flood your body with some medium which can drain off and distribute a concentration of this unbalanced charge, the ordinary bodily processes will be free to move in and clear up that wild cell damage. And that's what I have here. He, shell, he held the shielded needle between his knees, and from a side pocket of his lab coat, he took a plastic box, opened it, and drew out an alcohol swab. Still cheerfully talking, he took her terror-numbed arm and scrubbed at the inside of her elbow. 
I'm not for one second implying that nuclear charges in the atom are the same thing as static electricity. They're in a different league altogether. But the analogy holds. And I could use another analogy. I could liken the charge on the wild cells to accumulations of fat. And this gunk of mine is a detergent, which will break it up and spread it so far it can't be detected anymore. But I'm led to the static analogy by an odd side effect. Organisms injected with this stuff build up a hell of a static charge. It's a byproduct, and for reasons I can only theorize about at the moment, it seems to be keyed to the audio spectrum, tuning forks and the like. That's what I was playing with when I met you. That tree is drenched with this stuff. It used to have a whirl of wild cell growth. It doesn't anymore. He gave her the quick surprising smile and let it click away. With his other hand wrapped around her left biceps, he squeezed gently and firmly. The needle was lowered and placed and slid into the big vein so deftly that she gasped, not because it hurt, but because it did not. Attentively, he watched the bit of glass barrel protruding from a black housing as he withdrew the plunger a fraction and saw that puff of red into the colorless fluid inside. And then he bore steadily on the plunger again. Please don't move. I'm sorry. This will take a little time. I have to get quite a lot of this into you, which it's fine, you know. He resumed the tone of his previous remarks about audio spectra because side effect or no, this is consistent. Healthy biosystems develop a strong electrostatic field, unhealthy ones a weak one or none at all. With an instrument as primitive and simple as that little electroscope, you can tell if any part of the organism has a community of wild cells, and if so, where it is and how big and how wild. Deftly, he shifted his grip on the encased hypodermic without moving the point or varying the amount of plunger pressure. It was beginning to be uncomfortable, an ache turning into a bruise. And if you're wondering why this little mosquito has a housing on it with a wire attached, I'll tell you. Although, I bet you're not, and that you know as well as I do, I'm doing all this talking just to keep your mind occupied. It's nothing but a coil carrying a high-frequency alternating current. The alternating field sees to it that the fluid is magnetically and electrostatically neutral right from the start. He withdrew the needle suddenly and smoothly and bent her arm and trapped in the inside of her elbow a cotton swab. Nobody ever told me that before a treatment, she said. What's that? No charge, she said. Again, that wave of approval, this time with words. I like your style. How do you feel? She cast about for accurate phrases. Like the owner of a large sleeping hysteria begging someone not to wake it up. He laughed. In a little while, you're going to feel so weird you won't have time for hysteria. He got up and returned the needle to the bench, looping up the cable as he went. He turned off the AC field and returned with a large glass bowl and a square of plywood. He inverted the bowl on the floor near her and placed the wood on its broad base. I remember something like that, she said. When I was in junior high school, they were generating artificial lightning with a... I don't know, it had a long endless belt running over pulleys and some little wires scraping on it and a big copper ball on top. Van de Graaff generator, he said. That's right. They did all sorts of things with it. What I especially remember is standing on a piece of wood on a bowl, just like that, and they charged me up with the generator. And I didn't feel much of anything at all, except my hair stood out from end, and everybody laughed. I looked like an idiot. They said I was carrying 40,000 volts. Good, I'm glad you remember that. This'll be a little different, though, by roughly another 40,000. Oh, don't worry. As long as you're insulated, and as long as grounded or comparatively grounded objects, me, for example, stay well away from you, there won't be any fireworks. Are you going to use a generator like that? Not like that, and I already did. You're the generator. I am, whoa! 
She raised her hand from the upholstered chair, and there was a crackle of sparks and the faint smell of ozone. Oh, you sure are, and more than I thought, and quicker. Come on, get up. She started up slowly. She finished the maneuver with speed. As her body separated from the chair, she was, for a fractional second, seated in a tangle of spitting blue-white threads. They, or she, propelled her a yard and a half away, standing. Literally shocked half out of her wits, she almost fell. Stay on your feet, he snapped, and she recovered, gasping. He stepped back a pace. All right, get up on the board. Come on, quick now. She did as she was told, leaving for the two paces she traveled, brief footprints of fire. She teetered on the board. Visibly, her hair began to stir. What's happening to me, she cried. You're getting charged after all, he said jovially. But at this point, she failed to appreciate the extension of even her own witticism. She cried again. What is happening to me? It's all right, he said. He went to the bench and turned on a tone generator. It moaned deep in the one to 300 cycle range. He increased the volume and turned the pitch control and it howled upward. And as it did so, her red gold hair shivered and swept up and out, each hair attempting frantically to get away from all the others. He ran the tone up above 10,000 cycles and all the way back to a belly bumping inaudible 11. At the extremes, her hair slumped, but at around 1100, it stood out in, as she had described it, idiot fashion. He turned down the gain to a more or less bearable level and picked up the electroscope. He came toward her smiling. You are an electroscope, you know that? And a living Van de Graaff generator as well. Let me down, was all she could say. Not yet. Please hang tight. The differential between you and everything else here is so high that if you get near any of it, you'll discharge into it. It won't harm you, but you might get a burn and a nervous shock out of it. He held out the electroscope. Even at that distance, and in her distress, she could see the gold leaves writhing apart. He circled her, watching the leaves attentively, moving the instrument forward and back and from side to side. Once he went to the tone generator and turned it down some more. You're sending such a strong field, I can't pick up the variations, he explained, and returned to her, closer now. I, I can't handle much more. I can't, she murmured. He did not hear, or he did not care. He moved the electroscope near her abdomen, up, and from side to side. Yep, there you are, he said cheerfully, moving the instrument close to her right breast. Your cancer, right breast, low, around the armpit, he whistled. Mean one, too. It's malignant as hell. And she swayed and then collapsed forward and down. A sick blackness swept down on her, receded explosively in a glare of agonizing blue-white, and then crashed down on her like a mountain falling. Place where wall meets ceiling. Another wall, another ceiling. Hadn't seen it before. Didn't matter. Don't care. Sleep. Place where wall meets ceiling. Something in the way. His face, close, drawn, tired. Eyes awake, though, and penetrating. Doesn't matter. Don't care. Sleep place where wall meets ceiling, down a bit, late sunlight, over a little rusty gold chrysanthemums in a gold-green glass cornucopia, something in the way again, his face. Can you hear me? Yes, but don't answer. Don't move. Don't speak. Sleep. It's a room, a wall, a table, a man pacing, a nighttime window, and mums you'd think were alive, but don't you know they're cut right off and dying? Do you know that? How are you? Urgent, urgent. I'm thirsty. Cold and a bite to it that aches the hinges of the jaws, grapefruit juice, lying back on his arm while he holds the glass in the other hand. No, but, but. 
thank you. Thanks very, no, try to sit up the sheet. Oh, my clothes. Sorry about that, he said, the mind reader almost. Some things that have to be done just aren't consistent with pantyhose and a mini dress, but they're all washed and dried and ready for you anytime over there. The brown wool in the pantyhose and the shoes on the chair. He's respectful, standing back, putting the glass next to an insulated carafe on the night table. What things aren't consistent? Throwing up, bedpans, he said candidly. Protective with the sheet, which can hide bodies but not embarrassment, she said, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I must have shake, shake her head, and he slides back and forth in her vision. You went into shock, and then you just didn't come out of it. He hesitated. It was the first time she'd ever seen him hesitate over anything. She became, for a moment, an almost mind reader herself. Should I tell her what's in, her, in my mind? Sure he should, and he did. I think you didn't want to come out of it. It's all gone out of my head, she said. The pear tree, the electroscope, the injection, the electrostatic response. No, she said, not knowing, and then knowing, she said no. Hang on, he rapped, and the next thing she knew, he was by the bed, over her, his two hands hard on her cheeks. Don't slip off again. You can handle it. You can handle it because it's all right now. Do you understand that? You're all right. You told me I had cancer. It sounded pouty and accusing. He laughed at her, actually laughed. You told me you had it. Oh, but I didn't know. That explains it then, he said in a load off my back tone. There wasn't anything in what I did that would cause a three-day withdrawal like that. It had to be something in you. Three days I've been asleep? He simply nodded in response to that and went on with what he was saying. I get a little pompous once in a while, he said engagingly. It comes from being right so much of the time. I took a bit more for granted than I should have, didn't I? When I assumed you'd been to a doctor, maybe even had a biopsy. You didn't, did you? I was afraid, she admitted. She looked at him. My mother died of it, and my aunt and my little sister had a radical mastectomy. I couldn't bear it. And then when you... When I told you what you already knew and what you never wanted to hear, you couldn't take it. You blacked right out, you know. You fainted. It had nothing to do with the 70-odd thousand volts of static you were carrying. I caught you. He put out his arms, and instinctively she shrank back, but he held the arms where they were, on display, until she looked at them and saw the angry red scorch marks on his forearms and the heavy biceps as much of them as she could see from under his short-sleeved shirt. About nine-tenths knocked me out, too, he said, but at least you didn't crack your head on anything. Thank you, she said reflexively, and then began to cry. What am I going to do? Do? Go back home, wherever that is. Pick up your life, whatever that is. But you said, when are you going to get it into your head that what I did was not a diagnostic? Are you... You don't mean you cured it. I mean you're curing it right now. I explained it all to you before. You remember that, don't you? Not altogether, but yes. Surreptitiously, she felt under the sheet for the lump. It's still there. If I hit you over the head with a bat, he said with a slightly exaggerated simplicity, there would be a lump on it. It would be there tomorrow and the next day. The next day after that, it would be smaller. And in a week, you'd still be able to feel it, but it would be gone. Same thing here. At last, she let the enormity of it touch her. A one-shot cure for cancer. Oh, God, he said harshly. I can tell by looking at you that I'm going to have to listen to this speech again. Well, I won't. And startled, she said, what speech? The one about my duty to humanity? 
It comes in two phases and many textures. Phase one has to do with my duty to humanity, but really just means we could make a classic buck selling it. Phase two deals solely with my duty to humanity, and I don't hear that one very often. Phase two utterly overlooks the reluctance humanity has to accept good things unless they arrive from accepted and respectable sources. Phase one is fully aware of this, but gets very rat shrewd in figuring ways around it. She said, I don't understand and could get no further. The textures he overrode her are accompanied by the light of revelation, with or without religion and mysticism. They're cast sternly in the ethical philosophy mold and aim to force me to surrender through guilt mixed to some degree all the way up to total with compassion. But I only meant that you, he said, aiming a long index finger at her, have robbed yourself of the choicest example of everything I've just said. If my assumptions had been right and you had gone to your friendly local sawbones and he had diagnosed cancer, and referred you to a specialist who had done likewise, and in a random panic you had fallen into my hands and been cured and had gone back to your various doctors to report a miracle, do you know what you'd get from them? Spontaneous remission. That's what you'd get. And it wouldn't be only doctors, he went on with a sudden renewal of passion under which she quailed in her bed. Everybody has his own commercial. Your nutritionist would have nodded over the wheat germ or the macrobiotic rice cakes. Your priest would have dropped to his knees and looked at the sky. Your geneticist would have a pet theory about generation skipping and would assure you that your grandparents probably had spontaneous remission too and never knew it. Please, she cried, but he started shouting at her. Do you know what I am? I'm an engineer, twice over, mechanical and electrical, and I have a law degree. If you were foolish enough to tell anyone about what's happened here, I could be jailed for practicing medicine without a license. And you could have me up for assault because I stuck a needle into you, and even for kidnapping, if you can prove I carried you here from the lab. Nobody would give a damn that I cured your cancer. You don't know who I am, do you? No, I don't even know your name. And I won't tell you, he said. I don't know your name either. And I don't want to know. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. I don't want to hear it. I wanted to be involved with your lump, and I was. I want it and you to be gone as soon as you're both up to it. Have I made myself absolutely clear? Just let me get dressed, she said tightly, and I'll leave right now without making a speech, without making a speech. And in a flash, her anger turned to misery. And she added, I was going to say I was grateful. Would that have been all right? And his anger underwent a change too, for he came close to the bed and sat down on his heel, bringing their faces to a level. And he said, that would be fine. Although, you won't really be grateful for another 10 days when you get your spontaneous remission reports, or maybe for six months or a year or five when examinations keep on testing out negative. And she detected such a wealth of sadness behind this that she found herself reaching for the hand with which he steadied himself against the edge of the bed. He did not recoil, but he didn't seem to welcome it either. Why can't I be grateful now? That would be an act of faith, he said bitterly. And that just doesn't happen anymore, if it ever did. He rose and went toward the door. Please don't go tonight, he said. It's dark and you don't know the way. I'll see you out in the morning. When he came back in the morning, the door was open. The bed was made and the sheets were folded neatly on the chair together with the pillow slips and a towel she had used. She wasn't there. He came out into the entrance court and contemplated his bonsai. Early sun gold frosted the horizontal upper foliage of the old tree and brought its gnarled limbs into sharp relief, tough brown gray and crevices of violet. Only in the companion of a bonsai, there are owners of bonsai, but they are a lesser breed, fully understands this relationship. 
there is an exclusive and individual treeness to the tree because it is a living thing and living things change. And there are definite ways in which the tree desires to change. A man sees the tree and in his mind makes certain extensions and extrapolations of what he sees and sets about making them happen. The tree in turn will do only what a tree can do, will resist to the death any attempt to do what it cannot do or to do it in less time than it needs. The shaping of a bonsai is therefore always a compromise, always a cooperation. A man cannot create bonsai, nor can a tree. It takes both, and they must understand each other. It takes a long time to do that. One memorizes one's bonsai, every twig, the angle of every crevice and needle, and lying awake at night or in a pause a thousand miles away, one recalls this or that line or mass, and one makes one's plans with wire and water and light, with tilting and with the planting of water-robbing weeds or heavy root-shading ground cover, one explains to the tree what one wants, and if the explanation is well enough made and there is great enough understanding, the tree will respond and obey, almost. Always there will be its own self-respecting, highly individual variation. Very well. I shall do what you want, but I shall do it my way. And for these variations, the tree is always willing to present a clear and logical explanation. And more often than not, almost smiling, it will make clear to the man that he could have avoided it if his understanding had been better. It is the slowest sculpture in the world, and there is, at time, doubt as to what is being sculpted, man or tree. So he stood for perhaps ten minutes, watching the flow of gold over the upper branches, and then went to a carved wooden chest, opened it, shook out a length of disreputable cotton duck, opened the hinged glass at one side of the atrium, and spread the canvas over the roots and all the earth to one side of the trunk, leaving the rest open to wind and water. Perhaps in a while, a month or two, a certain shoot in the topmost branch would take this hint, and the uneven flow of moisture up through the cambium layer would nudge it away from that upward reach and persuade it to continue a horizontal passage. And perhaps not, and it would need the harsher language of binding and wire. But then it might have something to say, too, about the rightness of an upward trend, and perhaps it would say it persuasively enough to convince the man. Altogether, a patient, meaningful, and rewarding dialogue. Good morning. Oh, God damn, he barked. You made me bite my tongue. I thought you'd gone. I did. She knelt in the shadows with her back against the inner wall, facing the atrium. But then I stopped to be with the tree for a while. And then what? I thought a lot. What about? You. Did you now? Look, she said firmly, I'm not going to any doctor to get this thing checked out. I didn't want to leave until I had told you that, and until I was sure you believed me. Come on in, and I'll get you something to eat. Foolishly, she giggled. I can't. My feet are asleep. Without hesitation, he scooped her up in his arms and carried her around the atrium. She said, her arm around his shoulders, and their faces close. Do you believe me? He continued around until they reached the wooden chest, then stopped and looked into her eyes. I believe you. I don't know why you decided that, but I'll believe you. He set her down on the chest and looked back. It's that act of faith you mentioned, she said gravely. I thought you ought to have it at least once in your life, so you can never say such a thing again. She tapped her heels gingerly against the slate floor. Ow, pins and needles. You must have been thinking for a long time, he said. 
Yes. You want more? she asked. Yes. You are an angry, frightened man. He seemed delighted. Well, tell me all about that. No, she said quietly. You tell me. I'm very serious about this. Why are you angry? I'm not. Why are you angry? I'll tell you I'm not, although you're pushing me in that direction. Well then, why? He gazed at her for what, to her, seemed a very long time indeed. You really want to know, don't you? She nodded and waited. Where do you suppose all this came from? The house, the land, and the equipment. An exhaust system, he said, with a thickening of the voice she was coming to know. A way of guiding exhaust gases out of internal combustion engines in such a way that they're given a spin. Unburned solids are embedded in the walls of the muffler in a glass wool liner. It slips out in one piece and it can be replaced by a clean one every couple of thousand miles. The rest of the exhaust is fired by its own spark plug and what will burn burns. The heat is used to preheat the fuel. The rest is spun again through a 5,000 mile cartridge. What finally gets out is, by today's standards, pretty clean. Because of the preheating, it actually gets better mileage out of the engine. So you've made a lot of money, she said. I made a lot of money, he echoed, but not because the thing is being used to cut down on air pollution. I got the money because an automobile company bought it and buried it in a lockbox. They don't like it because it costs something to install in new cars. They don't like it because their friends in the refining business don't want high performance out of cruel feud, crude fuels. Well, all right. I didn't know any better, and I won't make that same mistake again. And yes, I'm angry. I was angry when I was a kid on a tank ship, and we were set to washing down bulkheads with chipped brown soap and canvas, and I went ashore and bought detergent, and tried it, and it was better, faster, and cheaper. So I took it to the boss, who gave me a punch in the mouth for pretending to know his job better than he did. Well, he was drunk at the time. But the rough part was when the old shellbacks in the crew got wind of it and ganged up on me for being what they called a company man. That's a dirty name on a ship. I just couldn't understand why people got in the way of something better for themselves. I've been up against that all my life. I have something in my head that just won't quit. It's a way I have of asking the next question. Why is so-and-so the way it is? Why can't it be such-and-such such instead? There's always another question to be asked about anything or any situation. Especially, you shouldn't quit when you like an answer because there's another answer after that. And we live in a world where people just don't want to ask the next question. I've been paid all my stomach will take for things people won't use. And if I'm mad all the time, it's really my fault. I admit it, because I just can't stop asking that next question and coming up with answers. There's a half dozen real blockbusters in that lab that nobody will ever see, and half a hundred more in my head. But what can you do in a world where people would rather kill each other in a desert than be shown that it could turn green and bloom? where they'll fall all over themselves to pour billions into developing a new oil rig when it's been proved over and over again that fossil fuels are killing us. Yes, I'm angry. Shouldn't I be? She let the echoes of his voice swirl around the court and out through the hole in the top of the atrium and waited a little longer to let him know he was here with her and not beside himself in his fury. He grinned at her sheepishly when he came to this, and she said, maybe you're asking the next question instead of asking the right question. I think people who live by wise old sayings are trying not to think, but I do know one that's worth paying some attention to, and it's this. If you ask a question the right way, you've just given the answer. 
She paused to see if he was paying real attention. He was. She went on. I mean, if you put your hand on a hot stove, you might ask yourself, how can I stop my hand from burning? And the answer is pretty clear, isn't it? If the world keeps rejecting what you have to give, there is some way of asking why that contains the answer. It's a simple answer, he said shortly. People are stupid. That isn't the answer, and you know it, she said. So what is? Oh, I can't tell you that. All I know is that the way you do something, where people are concerned, the way you do something is more important than what you do if you want results. I mean, you already know how to get what you want out of the tree, right? Well, I'll be damned, he said. People are living, growing things, too. I don't know a hundredth part about what, of what you do about bonsai, but I do know this. When you start one, it isn't often the strong, straight, healthy ones you take. It's the twisted, sick ones that can be made the most beautiful. When you get to shaping humanity, you might remember that. Of all the... I don't know whether to laugh in your face or punch you right in the mouth. She rose. He hadn't realized she was quite this tall. I'd better go, she said. Come on now, you know I was just kidding. It's a figure of speech. Oh, I didn't feel threatened, but I'd better go all the same. Shrewdly, he asked her, are you afraid I'll ask the next question? Terrified, she said. Ask it anyway. No, she said. And he said, then I'll do it for you. You said I was angry and afraid. You want to know what I'm afraid of? Yes. You. I'm scared to death of you. You have a way of provoking honesty, he said with some difficulty. I'm afraid of any close human relationship. I'm afraid of something I can't take apart with a screwdriver or a mass spectroscope or a table of cosines and tangents. His voice was jocular, but his hands were shaking. You do it by watering one side, she said softly, or by turning it just so in the sun. You handle it as if it were a living thing, like a woman or a bonsai. It will be what you want it to be if you let it be itself and take the time and the care. I think, he said, that you're making me some kind of offer. Are you? Sitting here most of the night, she said, I had a crazy kind of image. Do you think that two trees ever made bonsai out of one another? What's your name, he said. Thank you.